Now in this particular engine, I should note that I had to remove the muffler first before I could get access at our lower carburetor mounting bolt. And that was just because the muffler comes up and it was slightly blocking that bolt from being accessible. And to remove the muffler, it's pretty simple. It's just three bolts. You have two here and then you have one over here and you can go ahead and just slide off your muffler with your muffler gasket. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and just clean up this gasket surface because if we look here, you can see that someone has used some RTV silicone in the past because they didn't have the proper gasket to go with it. So I'm going to come in here with an X-Acto knife and just clean up all of this and then we'll be ready to hook up all of our linkages. Okay, so first things first, I'm going to be hooking up my throttle linkage first, then I'm going to hook up my choke linkage. Then once I have those two linkages hooked up, I'm going to go ahead and take this port right there and I'm going to seat it into the crankcase breather vent tube right there. So it should look a little something like this and then you could go ahead and spin your carburetor around and now your throttle linkage is hooked up the proper way. We can go ahead and hook up our choke linkage next and then like I said go ahead and get our crankcase breather tube hooked up and before you know it this thing will be running again. I'm going to be using a little bit of blue Permatex thread locker just to help prevent those bolts from backing out in the future so I'm right ready to go ahead and get my gasket here and install that. Now these intake bolts, you'll notice that they have two slots. You could go in with a slotted screwdriver, but I don't like to round off the head. I just like to get them snug or hand tight with my number three Phillips, and then I'm gonna go ahead with an open end wrench here and just snug them up so that they're tight top and bottom, and then I know they won't be backing out anytime soon. And just using a 3 8 inch open end wrench, I was able to get about a quarter more turn on those two bolts, so now I'm ready to reinstall my muffler. Now before we go any further, I have my throttle position on the idle or the lowest setting. You're going to come over to your carburetor here and we're just going to have a look at our linkage and the operation of our choke. So we're going to go into high RPM mode here, which is going to put maximum tension on our throttle. So you guys are going to see that it is snapping back like it's supposed to. So when it's in the idle position, it's giving the least amount of air. And when you're in the high RPM mode, it's giving the maximum amount of air and we have the maximum amount of tension on our governor. And then what we're going to do is come into the top position here, which is the choke. And I'll position my camera so you guys can see, but you want to make sure that your choke plate Butterfly valve there closes all the way fully and then when you release it into the run position it opens up. So the linkage here and the carburetor is working as it's supposed to. So we're now ready to reinstall my muffler and then I'll go ahead and you guys can see that I just used another quick 90 degree fuel shutoff valve to prevent the fuel because my customer said he put a full tank of fresh fuel in this thing. Uh, I just wanted to hook that up to prevent the fuel from leaking out so I can go ahead and pop that off and hook up our fuel line once we have our muffler installed. And before I go ahead and install my muffler, I'm going to be using some Permatex copper anises. On these exhaust bolts, they tend to rust all the time because of heating and cooling, heating and cooling, they corrode. But unlike the nickel anises, the copper anises here will withstand a much higher heat rating. So you guys will see temperature range up to 980 degrees Celsius, which is 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. So this stuff, just a little dab on the ends of those bolts and that'll prevent them from seizing because if anyone ever has to remove this carburetor in the future, or maybe I do in five or 10 years, who knows, to replace a needle valve or something like that, if these bolts seize into place and you go to remove them in one snaps, now you're gonna have to go through a lot of hassle to get that bolt out. Or if it's seized, then you might not be able to access your lower carburetor bolt. So again, I'm just thinking towards the future and I always like to use a little bit of anti-seize whenever I can. So I got my muffler installed with my heat shield here and you'll notice that on the fuel line, they use this little metal pipe and that's just gonna block some of that heat from the fuel line. So what I'm gonna do is pull my fuel shutoff valve off and I'm gonna install either a green or a red fuel line clamp here because this fuel line didn't have a clamp on it and I wanna run a clamp. And prime example here, you guys will notice that the red, which is normally tight on a regular fuel line, is loose on this one. And that's because this Tigon has a much thinner wall. So even though it's a little firmer and less malleable than a regular fuel line, it does have a thinner wall, which means you're gonna to have to run a different size 
fuel clamp, so I'm probably gonna run a smaller metric fuel line clamp. So I have a new fuel line clamp installed here. This is a metric, and I've chosen to use a 10 millimeter fuel line clamp. It fits nicely. So like I said, I'm gonna go ahead and transfer that over now. And now that our fuel line's hooked up, the last thing I'm doing is changing the spark plug. So we're gonna be going from a Champion RJ19LM. You guys can see that uh, it's old, filled with debris here. I'm gonna be switching that up for an NGK BR2-LM. So this is an RJ19LM replacement. And I've heard that these burn more efficiently and burn a little bit cleaner than the Champion RJ19LM. So I've been trying them out. I went and bought a big shot pack of them and I've just been using them up. I haven't had any starting issues with them at all, but I can't say if they burn more efficiently or not. Really, it uh, doesn't appear to be any different than a Champion RJ19LM. But at some point next year, once I get one of my machines that I've installed a BR2LM into, I'll be able to pull it out and have a look to see if it's as fouled up or as carboned up as a lot of these RJ19LMs that I've had in the past. Okay, so a couple little things that I wanted to note here. There is an airbox bottom, I guess you can call it, that goes kind of like this onto the carburetor and lays flat down here. The only thing is once that's on, I won't be able to come up to my air fuel adjustment screw or the pilot jet here. So before I go to install that, I'm just gonna make sure that this jet, that's that long thin one that goes all the way down. I'm gonna make sure that that is snug and then I'm gonna go and set this one here to approximately one and three quarters of a turn out. So I'm gonna thread it in, not over tightening it, and then I'm gonna back it off one and three quarters of a turn. That should give us a, a good baseline and then we can go ahead and make any adjustments that we need afterwards once we get this thing running. So that's half, that's one, that's one and a half, and then one and three quarters is about right there. Okay, so I'm right ready to install my airbox base here, but there is a slight issue that I'm running into. On the 491604 carburetor, we have the little airbox base, I'm gonna call it mount, and it's located farther to the right. Now, if we go ahead and look at our carburetor here, we're gonna notice that the mount there is on the left. So the main difference between a 491604, which is this carburetor, and a 491590, which is this carburetor, is that mounting location. But there's no need to freak out or worry because what I'm gonna do is simply go up under here and I'm gonna try my best to mark the basic location of that mount there. And I'm just gonna come up here and drill a small hole. And then I can go ahead and relocate my bolt because this is plastic so it's super easy to drill through. Then what I can do is go ahead and put a little bit of epoxy inside of that hole to seal that up and then I can go ahead and install this. So once again, you're gonna have to go through a little bit of modification every now and then when you use these aftermarket carburetors and especially because we're using a separate part number. So instead of using the original 491604, because this carburetor here has been discontinued and the only place I was able to get it was eBay and it was an astronomical price plus import fees plus exchange rate, plus shipping. I mean, it would have been like $200 or something like that. So discontinued carburetor, easily accessible on Amazon. And I think I spent $76 on this carburetor. I'm not sure if I mentioned that before, but it's a great point to make that you're saving a lot of money, but you're having to go through these little modification issues. And I guess at the end of the day, you get what you pay for. If we purchase something for $200, we would have something that could bolt right up and we wouldn't have to make any modifications. Whereas we're spending 76 and we're having to do all of these little tiny adjustments here. Okay, so first things first, there are these little supporting brackets here that kind of go up and that just directs air from your flywheel into your air box. Now on this one, it was interfering with our post. So I just went ahead and used my grinder to just notch some of that out. So using a white paint marker here, making sure to keep the rear of the airbox bottom flat, we can see that there is a slight gap. So I'm gonna have to run some sort of bushing or spacer, but I just went ahead and gave myself a little paint mark there. We're gonna go ahead and drill a small pilot hole here and we're gonna try to line ourselves up. And then like I said, I can go ahead and just use a basic bushing on there and then I won't have to worry about an air leak over here because you don't want dirt getting in there. You wanna make sure that you have a nice flat seal, which means that we're gonna to have to raise that mount approximately a half an inch. So now I just gotta figure out what I'm gonna use for a spacer. I might have something kicking around, so I'm gonna go into my scrap bin and 
have a look. Okay, so as for what I'm gonna use to make up my distance, I've chosen to use three washers stacked on top of each other. And then I'm just using the old bolt and we can see that it threads in nicely. So now I need to run a longer bolt. So I'm just gonna take this bolt here and go into my scrap bolt pile and see if I can find a replacement that is longer. Okay, so what I've done here is taped three of those washers together with a little bit of electrical tape, just quickly done that. So our air box base here is now perfectly level. So now I just have to find an extended bolt that I can use to put through our new hole. And then I'm gonna go ahead and fill up the other hole that was there before with a little bit of super glue. Now, the only thing I've noticed is that the original hole went off of where the air filter normally goes, whereas our hole here is right on the edge. So what I'm gonna do is because there's not a lot of plastic here to make a countersink, which is basically something like this where your bolt head can sit into. What I'm gonna do is probably just grind off a bit of the head to make it as flat as possible, but leaving just enough material so that it's got something to bite onto. And then when I go ahead to install my new air filter, which I do have, I'll just make sure that once I get the air filter snugged down onto the posts, that there is a nice seal between the bolt head and the rubber bottom of the air filter. So I have my brand new OEM Briggs & Stratton air filter here. The number is a 399806S. And then to wrap around that air filter, I have a Stens pre-filter. That's uh, part number 100-842, replacing a Briggs & Stratton 271962S. So to seal up this hole, instead of using a two-part epoxy like I would normally do, I'm gonna be using some Permatex Ultra Bond. This is super glue and what I'm gonna be doing is taking this super glue, we're gonna take a little bit of tape and put it on the underside of the hole here. And basically what we're gonna do is take a little bit of super glue, put it in there, and then we're gonna use a bit of baking soda and sprinkle it on top. Now what that does is it starts a chemical reaction and it's going to harden the super glue almost instantaneously. And then we can go ahead, take some more drops of super glue and then put a little bit more baking soda on there and it will essentially make plastic and it will be nice and hard and it will fill that hole perfectly. So we won't be getting any air or dirt passing through there. So I have a piece of Gorilla Tape on the back there just to give me a, a nice little backing. I'm gonna take a little bit of super glue here. We're gonna pour it in and I'm gonna go ahead and take a little bit of baking soda and we're just going to Put some baking soda right in there and it should make a nice little hard surface. Now what you can do is put more baking soda in there. Get it into the center just like that and then take some more of your super glue. And just keep filling it up just like that guys. I can feel it's already turning into a plastic. Now I don't want to use too much, but I want to use enough here to fill that hole nicely. So we're just gonna wipe that off like that. Check that out guys. It's pretty much already hard. Awesome. Then right here I have a 1032 by one inch long screw and you're gonna notice that it has a rounded head but I went ahead and just took the head to my bench grinder there just to remove a little bit more material so that I can get the air filter to seal as best as I can. So I've already started the threads coming through there. I'm gonna go ahead and line this up. We're gonna screw that down and we're gonna fit everything up. And just like that, the bottom of our air box is installed. Almost looks factory, guys. Check that out. You wouldn't even be able to know unless you pointed out the little spacers there and you know the hole that we've plugged there. Okay, so I'm not sure if you'll be able to see or not, but you see that little indentation there? That's where we're hitting, just on the edge. So what I'm gonna do is bring this over to my bench grinder, and I'm just gonna slightly nick that rubber just a little bit right in that spot. So just removing that little tiny bit of rubber there, you can see like it's not even going to affect the rest of the air filter because this air filter still has the dual layers that it seals. It seals out here and then it seals in here as well. So this isn't gonna let any dirt or debris through, it'll just give me enough of a clearance so that the rest of the filter will sit flush. So looking at it from this side, we can see that it just gives us enough room there to have the rest of the air filter sit flat. So everything's looking good here. I've gone ahead and tightened up my two air filter tabs. Now the only thing I wanted to note that I didn't cover before was, now that we know this carburetor doesn't have to come off again, go ahead and tighten up your 
5 16 bolt on not only the engine block but up on the carburetor as well and that is just a little extra support mount so that your carburetor doesn't vibrate but we're ready to go ahead and get the air filter cover here and just like that our carburetor has been replaced we got a new fuel shutoff valve in there new intake gasket new air filter new pre-filter new spark plug and we're just going to come over here and i'm going to double check make sure it's got oil in it and we can see that it does in fact have oil so my customer keeps his oil fresh and at the right level so i'm going to go ahead and take this thing outside and fire it up so we're going to come down here turn the fuel valve on okay so we got our choke on So you guys can hear there's a slight miss in the engine every now and then. We can take care of that with a little bit of air fuel adjustment, but it runs. It runs pretty good too. So what we're going to do now is let this thing warm up to operating temperature. Then I can go ahead and play around with the main jet. That's at the very bottom of the carburetor. What we're going to do is we're going to thread it in until the engine wants to stop and thread it out until the engine starts sputtering. Then we're going to find the midway point. Once we have the main jet adjusted properly, we can go ahead and do the air fuel adjustment up top. So that's it guys, carburetor swap, a quick little carburetor adjustment is all we needed to get it to run a little smoother, but I'm happy to say that this thing is back up and running again. So that's it for part two of this carburetor replacement video series that I did. We were able to get this machine up and running with only some minor modifications needed to that aftermarket carburetor. And like I've said in previous videos, guys, whenever you're buying an aftermarket carburetor from China, a lot of times you're going to have to do these slight modifications. But if you guys enjoyed the video, think about leaving me a thumbs up. You know, it really helps me out. You can click here to subscribe and click over here to watch one of my previous videos. I upload every single week, so be sure to stop on by next week. Check the channel out for new content. And as always, guys, thanks for watching.